Thank you for that time of worship. I love sitting up here. Usually the last song or so, I kind of don't sing as much because I want to make sure I'm listening to the Lord for the message He's going to give me as I'm coming up here because He always gives me one last little tug there and gives me a chance to grab, grab my breath. But I always love listening to you guys sing during that time and the Lord's always speaking and you know, to dwell together, right? The Lord dwells with us. This Bible word, dwell, is all through Scripture, is powerful and amazing. And we're going to look at that again today because that's the whole point of what we're doing is to engage with one another. Because I think the hardest thing right now about the world we live in is to just not go hide wherever it is. I prefer to dig a hole all the way down, hide, and bury myself. How many people, everybody raise your hand. Come on. We're all in a world where we're looking around going, oh my gosh, what's going on? Yeah, thank you. We cannot be authentic. And, and how do we navigate that as Christians? Well, I've come up with one answer and only one answer. Together. We need to do this together through trials, through tribulations, through struggles. We need to be together. Ezra, I don't have control of this thing. Want to give me the next slide? All right, the call to engage with Christ, and that's kind of what we're looking at these few weeks, and not in order of importance, but all very important to your Christian walk. So the first thing we looked at is Matthew 5, 16, being a light on the hill, being able to engage with your community. Today, we're going to look at this Old Testament Psalm 133, and we're going to kind of try and apply it to the church a little bit, because what I want people to understand is unity and the body doing life together, or God's people doing life together, is not a new idea. This is something that's going on for a long time, and then we'll continue to look at living within our families and the church and our example, ultimately, of Christ. So engaging in your community, engaging in your church. Oh, let me just get to where we are. Perfect. So here we are today, we're looking at the church. Um, Larry Krabs, I don't know if anybody here knows who Larry Krabs is, but he, wrote, he writes some wonderful books, Shattered Dreams. If you haven't read that, that's a phenomenal book, not to give him a plug, but it is a plug worth giving. What we have is this idea in Shattered Dreams that everything you thought life was going to be like just got shattered because you've come to a life in Christ. Now what does life look like moving forward? Well, anyways, he talks in his book, Soul Talk, he says, which is worse? So this is him asking, a church program to build community that doesn't get off the ground or a person sitting every Sunday in the back of the church who remains unknown? A Sunday school class that once drew hundreds but now has dwindled down to 30 or a Sunday school teacher whose sense of failure is never explored by a caring friend? A family torn apart by the father's drinking, his wife's frustration, and their third grader's learning disability, or a self-hatred dad and a terrified mom and a lonely boy. Three human beings whose beauty and value no one ever discovers. A national campaign that fails to gain steam for pro-life movement on a single woman, or a single woman on her way home from an abortion clinic in the backseat of a taxi. A woman whose soul no one ever touches. We may notice the unknown pew sitter. We wonder how the teacher of the now small class feels. We worry over each member of the torn up family and we feel for the guilt and the pain of a woman who has ended her baby's life. But what do, but we do what's easier. We design programs. We brainstorm ways to build attendance. And in our outrage over divorce statistics and abortion numbers, we fight for family families, family values. These things resonate with me. And all these things I think are good, is which the author says. All these things are good, but we do not talk to the pew sitter. We do not ask the teacher how he's feeling. We do not invite the dad to go play golf, which I actually had that last week. Somebody invited me, hopefully, maybe, or at least I took it as that. We do not invite the woman to lunch or the little boy to play. So what this is telling us is, hey, all these things that the church is concerned about is wonderful. But in the end of it, do we remember that there's people 
behind this that have breaking hearts that need each other. And even further, he's talking to the church. So he's telling us those people are in this room. How many people struggled this week? And could he use, yeah, people with them. Okay, this is why our church has to look different than the church universal right now. We have to do life together. We have to love each other. It has to look different. How many people agree that the church in America needs to start looking different? I do, too. And I think we start with love. And not the world's love. So let's look at this. Open up one to Psalm 133.1 with me. It's in your bulletin if you have a copy of that. We're going to spend most of the day here. point of it being small is I want you to keep this open all day today. Right here. But I'm going to read through it really quick, and I want you to just listen. Behold, how good and how pleasant is it for brothers to dwell together in unity. See, Old Testament unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard of even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edge of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commands the blessing, live forever, live forever. And so you sit there and you're like, how does this Bible verse tie into unity? Well, we're going to look at that today because in the Old Testament, this here is just screaming out unity all over. And so we're going to dig into that. But before we do that, one mental thought. A believer's call to dwell in the world is intentional, relational, and urgent. You have to pick up this idea. You have to embrace this. We follow a God who was intentional, relational, and had an urgency to how he lived. He didn't go, I need a three-week vacation in the Bahamas. Okay? So, am I against a three-week vacation in the Bahamas? No. Just keep in mind, the Lord might put somebody next to you in your lawn chair that needs to know about the Lord. You're not off. You're just in a different spot. We always share the Lord. So we have this intentional, relational, and urgent. I promise you, you dig a hole down and you hide in it like I'd like to do some days, and guess what's going to be at the bottom of that hole? Somebody that the Lord is going to reach. Because everywhere you go, he's going to use you. Or I don't believe you'd be here. So let's look at this. Psalm 133.1. Behold, how good and how pleasant is it for brothers to dwell together in unity. Unity is not a new thought. It is not a new idea. And it's something that you need to ask yourself just very simply. Am I dwelling in unity with people around me? I think it's good to have some friends that aren't Christians. How many people would agree with that? Me too. Okay, but I also think it's better 80-20. Can you say that 80% of your friends are Christians that you are running with, that you are doing life with, that you know their dog's name, their cat's name, their kid's name? Like, we need to be doing life Together, together, together. Maybe we need to add a few more togethers to it. But Psalm 33 starts off and it lets us know it's not a new thought. Unity. God is pounding unity from the beginning. Why? Because naturally we breed division. Naturally we disagree. That's what you get when you look at Corinth, book of Corinthians. Three different groups of Christians all trying to live together all disagreeing with each other. And Paul was telling him, I know you all disagree with each other, but get along. Get along, one another. Colossians takes a look at it. Colossians 3, 12 through 14, looks at it like this. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. So if you've been chosen and holy and beloved, chosen of God, it says this. Put on a new heart. Put on a heart of compassion. Kindness. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has complained against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, also should you forgive them. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And we get this idea that we start showing in Scripture, put on. You need to be intentional. You need to put on this unity. You need to wake up tomorrow morning and go, 
oh my gosh, there's members in my church that are going through this, and today they're not going through it alone. I'm going through it with them. Do you take that kind of compassion? Do you look at it? Do you put on this love that creates a perfect bond of unity? We live in a world right now where I know there's people in this body right here that need to be loved, need to be reached. How many people would admit right now that they need an extra touch of love? Yeah, awesome, guys, awesome. I see you guys raising your hands, and it's powerful. I'd love somebody today on that list, somebody in my church, because there's people that need that in a desperate way. And the point of all this is so we get to 1 Peter, which is where we're at as a church today, which I thought was really clear. So open up the 1 Peter, because we should all be there. Everybody get their Bibles out, because I want to look at this one word. Normally, I don't like to play fancy word games or look at words, but I want to embrace one word here today. And so it says, since you have in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. So you bought into the commandment to love one another. Okay? It says now, fervently love one another from the heart. Fervently love one another from the heart. Well, this word fervent is incredible. And I started pondering it and looking at definitions of it. Okay, this is not like I'm going to get off work today and maybe I'm going to catch up with somebody. This is fervent love. It's an action word. It's an intense action word. It's a deep, deep, passionate, fervent love. It's an intense love. It's a focused love. It's a targeted love. And it's a planned love. And this is the type of love we're supposed to have from one another from the, from the heart. Right from our heart. Why? Here's why. And it's so powerful. For you have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but of imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. Hey, look around. For those of us that believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have to fervently love one another because we're going to be together forever. Like eternity forever. This building will go, but God might call you up one day and say, all right, huddle up in your groups. And we're all going to have to show up because we identified as a group here on planet Earth. I don't know. But I'm hoping we all get to hang out. I'm looking forward to knowing you. I'm looking forward to hanging out with people up in heaven. But we have to understand that this fervent love comes because this is an eternal journey together, a forever journey together. Deep in our heart, are you longing to go to heaven? How many people? Okay. How many people stop and add to that? I am so excited that I'm going to get to go to heaven and my wife's going to be there and that you guys are going to be there and we're going to get to share experiences together and we're going to be so intimate in our conversations because we don't have to hide our sin and we don't have to feed our flesh. And so we can be so deeply intimate with one another. And it's going to blow our minds what happens there. It's going to be a pure, fervent love. But here we need to start loving this way. Letting down our guards, being more transparent, letting everybody know that I experienced the human condition. Okay, it's okay to say that. Not in this world, but it's okay to say, wow, this concerns me. This doesn't. I have my own experiences, which is one more reason fervent love happens in relationships. So here's all these weekly studies and moments to engage, a place to get even closer with those in our church family. I would love to say sometimes that my Bible study time in Peter or whatever book I'm in is my favorite part of our Bible study, okay? But that would be a lie because I love the time we talk I love the time we pray. I love the time we share lives. I love the whole hour and a half. And maybe an hour of it's in the Bible, but there's time of it that there's unity made. And I've formed friendships. I had a, a gentleman ask me last night, because he knows I moved here in the last eight months, and he's new here, what, what it was like moving here and how it was like building relationships. And I told him all the incredible friendships I've been making and things I've been doing. And he told me he wasn't having that same success. And I said, come meet my friends, of course, right? But 
yeah, he wasn't plugged into a church. He isn't going to Bible studies. He isn't, isn't a community. And so it shouldn't shock me that he's sitting there without the same friends. And so this is where it happens. We get together. We fervently love. 80% of the battle, I think, for the church right now is just getting us to show up together. The world doesn't want that. So let's wrap this up and look at this urgency. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the Mount of Zion. And so dew in the Bible, if for, for those that need to know, dew in the Bible always is a sign of God's favor, his new mercies. His mercies are new every day. It was God's favor and blessing upon the children of Israel. And so we have this blessing. God's finally saying, hey, unity is good. Unity is stuck to you like oil. And unity and the blessings from it are going to be coming every day, like the dew. It's new, and it's going to come every day. Lamentations 3, through 23 says, The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So here's where we are. Here's where we sit. His mercies are new every day. Why does he tell us that? I actually think it's because we've been horrible at unity. So he wants to remind them, hey, I'm telling you to do unity. I'm telling you to stick together like oil. I know you haven't been good at it, so my mercies are going to come down new every day. New blessings, a new chance to what? Draw a line. So I encourage everybody right now, draw a line in your life. Ask yourself where you're at with your unity with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Be willing to say, you know what? There were times I did that better, or there were times I did that worse. But be willing to analyze yourself and draw that line, because this is what the New Testament says about the urgency behind it. Everybody open up to Hebrews 10, 23 to 25. And we'll finish up here with a couple thoughts. Try and hear an urgency. I love hearing pages turn. Hear an urgency behind this voice, behind the author. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all more as you see the day drawing near. And so Hebrews 10, 23 tells us this. Consider how to stimulate one another. This requires us being together. This requires you right now going, how can I encourage people in this room to do their walk better? And is that on your list of things you want to pick up? How are you doing that? The second point, it says not forsaking our own assembly together as in the habit of some. And so here's the deal. I a lot of times don't think we forsake the church as much as it just becomes an afterthought. Oh, I, haven't, I haven't been to church for a while. Works with a lot of our Christian walks. Oh, I need to get back to reading the Bible. Oh, I was more plugged in here. Well, this is why coming together with groups and, and, and activities where there's people who are going to go, hey, where have you been? I miss you. Is everything all right? Can I help? Okay. Not forsaking is very rarely somebody going, I'm done with them. There's those out there that have done that, okay, and have decided that they can have church by themselves with a tree. But for the rest of us, I think a lot of times we can just forsake the church in our busyness, not place it first, not get at the key of our focus. And so... We need each other. If there was ever in a time in my life that I wanted to, to, to kind of just stay a couple feet back from people, stand off, not engage, it would probably be now for all of us. Okay? We still need to remember that there's a gospel message that needs to be delivered. There's a world without hope, and there's a church that needs to be unified and look different, and look different. I will say this to the bottom of my heart till the day I go down, right? This time we live in his ark. 
but it's not even close to as dark as my life was when I was 12 years old and I found out my mom was running off with another woman and I was left with a father that was going to have some of his own struggles at the time. That's dark at 12 years old. That's sick dark. So remember right now, there's little kids going through this. There's families experiencing darkness beyond darkness. and We need to get them in here. Well, part of what's going to glue them here when they hit here is they're going to see how loving we are, how different we are. So we need to do this. We need to stop and start encouraging. But encourage one another. So the question I have for you is, am I engaged with the church? And all more as I see the day drawing near. So am I drawing in? And here's what I'm asking. I already gave a disclaimer in the beginning that I thought this church was awesome at it. I didn't. I think we're awesome at doing life together. But I'm going to call us out a little right here and say, let's go one step further. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Keep getting closer. Anybody that walks through that door, I want us to love them. I want us to embrace them. I want to bring us in and be part of our family and feel loved. And we've been doing a wonderful part about that. The reason somebody should not come to this church would be because they walk through the door and they want to hide out and we're too loving. I would love to hear that. But that would be the only thing I would love to hear is that they're so loving. And you know what? I've had people who are new at our congregation come in and tell us, oh my gosh, your church is off the hook loving. So I love that you guys have set that DNA years before I ever came around. And it's precious. And as we grow, we don't want to lose it. And today, I'm calling on those who are good at loving to be the example our world needs and love even more. Love even more. Love even, love fervently one another. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you and we thank you for who you are. Lord, we thank you that the idea, the concept of fervent love is something that could only be you. You are the ultimate one who loves. And so, Lord, we live in a world that has all kinds of crazy ideas of what love is. But, Lord, I know that love is, love came down, put himself on a cross and died. That's the kind of fervent love we need to love one another with. And so, Lord, tug on our hearts, empower us, equip us, and train us, not necessarily just to go out into the world with fervent love, but to fervently love one another and become your church, your bride. And we just pray that in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.